Why would a Marxian feminist become a follower of Jesus? It's just a complete and total rebellion against, you know, husbands and fathers and that whole concept. But after a while, there's this thing called reality that gets you away. How does the gospel of Marx, Freud, and Darwin contrast with the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Our guest today has a remarkable story that needs to be told and needs to be heard. Kelly, since the time we met in North Carolina, maybe six months ago, I've been really looking forward to having you on. So thanks for joining me. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, I'm really happy to be here. Well, let's jump right into your story. We have an article that I'm going to link to below where you start off describing the kind of kid you were, which helps paint the picture of the story. So tell us about that. So I'll tell you in a word. My mom told me that, you know, most two-year-olds are no, no, and three-year-olds are why. I was the two-year-old with no and why all the time. I was very precocious and never stopped talking and have never stopped asking why. So I was mm. high energy and a, a lot to, to keep up with. Mm. I have two biological sisters and an adopted sister. And so my family has navigated just the beauty and goodness of adoption. When I read your article, it jumped out that a key part of your story and your identity was, in fact, being adopted. So tell us a little bit about that, if you will. Sure. My parents wanted six kids when they married in the 60s, and my mom had two biological boys. But they were really, really big babies, and she was very small. So the doctor said, time to close up shop. So they pursued the adoption route and adopted my older sister, um, who's two years older than me. We are not biologically related. And then um, adopted me. And then after four, they, they were done. So we were both adopted as infants. But I think the neat part is being adopted was a very special part of our life. Mm -hmm. It has never been weird. It has never been difficult. And there's a great book called The Chosen Baby. It was written by a woman named Valentina Wathen. And it's basically um, just talking about how special being adopted is. And I remember my mom telling me that the adoption agency said, always use the word adoption and love in the same sentence. So we were chosen children. We were special. My brothers thought we they got to pick us out, you know, even though that's sort of a little bit of a fiction. But um, it was never an issue um, until I became um, a little bit older and I started to have some questions. But it wasn't about being adopted. It was just about understanding a little bit more about where I came from. That makes sense. Well, we are going to come to the time you reach out and meet your birth mom and how dramatic that was. But the funny thing is my younger sister likes to tell us, she says, you know what? You guys were just kind of a gamble. Mom and dad didn't pick you, but she chose <laughs> me. And I exactly. love it. There's something just yes. so fun about that. So yes. your family was religious. Tell us a little bit about your religious Christian roots, but then what started to change and quite literally fall apart when you were 12? Certainly. So I, my parents were, um, they were not saved when they married, but they were both saved in their 30s. I came along when mom was 35. We were members of a, of a Baptist church in downtown Orlando, very Southern Baptist, and grew up going to church, you know, regular Sunday school and, and church and Wednesday night fellowship. It was very, very standard routine. And when I turned 12, our church was moving from their downtown location to build a new facility. It was sort of like the rise of, of the mega church. And mm. this is in the, in the sort of early 19, early to mid 1980s. Yeah. Around 1985, I would be turning 12. And I remember my parents, two, two things, they were very consistent tithers. And so they were, they were quote, good contributors to the church. <laughs> But also they held a, an in-home Bible study for the senior high students in their home on Tuesday nights. Well, there was a conflation of two things. My dad challenged the way they were going to use some of the funds in the new facility and thought that they were overspending. I think it was specifically an orchestra pit. And he was like, we don't need one that's going down and going up. And so that created some problems. But at the same time, the high school seniors were really, really enjoying the Bible study a little bit more than they were enjoying Sunday school. Oh. And a lot of, right. And so, but a lot of the, the fathers of the students were elders or deacons in the church. So it was essentially, you will give up the Bible study or you will leave the church. So initially they gave up the Bible study, but it just wasn't sustainable. And the preacher lived in our neighborhood. So there was just a lot of, a lot of politics 
And as we started to go to church less and less, I didn't mind because I was tired and I was a teenager. <laughs> I don't want to get up on a Sunday morning anyway. But we went across the street to the Presbyterian church because they had a great youth group. But it just, it just never stuck. And my parents were frustrated. And I think when you have a you have a church challenge like that that has nothing to do with the gospel, and you feel that things aren't being prayerfully considered, it, it just doesn't stick. And at around the same time, my dad started to have some challenges. He was a construction, um, he was a sheet metal contractor, had his own business. There were some challenges with expanding, unionization, just a lot of things happening. And we just slowly stopped attending church consistently. Hmm. And so by the time I was in high school, I'm the youngest of four. Um, church just wasn't a part of our lives anymore. Hmm. We, weren't, we didn't lose faith, but we certainly didn't go to church. Okay, so there wasn't like a sense of like anger and hurt at the church. It was just like, this just isn't that important to me and I'm doing other things. Not for me. It was obviously for my parents, okay. but it wasn't for me. Okay, that makes sense. Now, another yeah. piece of story that you've shared, and I really appreciate this, is you've talked about since about ninth grade. So this is probably about two years after the story you were starting at 12, when, describe when you were 12, is certain weight issues that affected you and your self-image. Talk about that a little bit if, if you can. Certainly. So this is, this is a really important part of my story, and I've thought for many years how best to tell it. Because those who were involved, I certainly don't want to throw anybody under the bus or be disrespectful mm. to what they were trying to do. Um, they're trying to be helpful, but did it in the wrong way. Okay. Growing up in the South in the 1980s, um, body image is a really big deal. The skinny girls are the popular girls. And this is also the rise of Jane Fonda and aerobics and, you know, the, the nutritionist for everybody. I mean, I think I saw my first nutritionist when I was 12. You know, we all were, you know, all we wanted to do was eat candy all day long. But apparently in my biological medical file was a history of diabetes and obesity. Mm. And what I didn't know until my, many years later is my birth mother apparently tried to find me when I was around 15 okay. and my parents blocked it, but they learned a lot about the situation. And so it was sort of Kelly's a fat person by it's sort of biologically trying to live in a skinny person's body. So to avoid ever becoming fat and obese, we need to control it now. And so and this happened to my sister, too. And this was also something very common with the neighborhood girls. And there was a lot of pressure if you weren't somebody with a super high metabolism. I mean, I was 110 pounds soaking wet. So I'm not really sure what, you know, what, what the concern was. But it started to be a differential between what the boys could eat and what the girls could eat. There was girls' food and there was boys' food. There were shelves of, you know, boy cereal, girl cereal. You know, we got the grape nuts. They got Lucky Charms. And it started to create a deep sense of deprivation and a fear about what would happen if my body got fat. I wasn't fat, but what happened if I did go there, then nobody would like me anymore and the guys certainly wouldn't want to date me. And so it created in me, my sister and I handled it very differently, but it created a very, very deep sense of insecurity for me fear that food would be taken away. So I started to binge, but I never purged because I didn't like to throw up. But um, I felt um, I struggled a lot. And so the whole focus of my self-esteem became my body, mm. not my worth, not my brain, not how well I did, but it was all about how I looked. And um I wouldn't be able to pledge a sorority if I didn't look a certain way, if I wasn't a certain size. I mean, this is like all about, we go to college, we pledge the right sorority, you know, we get our MRS degree. And right, I'm right. like, I just want to be a doctor or I want to be anything but that. You know, I was very precocious. I was very interested and very curious in all kinds of things. And so it created a lot of problems for me that would ultimately set me up to be um, right for the pickings. 
so to speak, for the feminists later on in my life. Thanks for sharing that. And this is before social media, which, if anything, just exacerbates that oh. pressure nonstop. And that's a whole nother conversation. But your willingness to share and open up about that is powerful because it's so common amongst amongst women today. But let's let's take that step you're talking about ripe for the pickings. So you describe being radicalized into critical theories as mm -hmm. a college student. So how did that process take place? And what do you mean that you were just kind of ripe? You don't mean just mean intellectually, but kind of emotionally where you were as well. Yes. So I'm going to take you this one stair step on the way to college that um, isn't an article just due to length. Great. Um, but I was so terrified of going to college and not being able to pledge the right sorority. I figured out how to skip it all together. And I was a cadet at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs for a year. And if you're somebody who's remotely insecure, that is the worst place to go <laughs> because okay, they will okay. they, they will beat your personal, you know, your mm. personal identity out of you because the whole point is to become a part of, of a team. Well, after the first year, I just was like, this is a huge mistake. I didn't realize that like, you really needed to want to be in the military. <laughs> like a really like a long commitment. And I called my parents and they allowed me to move home. And I moved back to Orlando, Florida, where I'm originally from. And I went to, um, I went to college and I went to pledge in a sorority and all the girls who were in high school the year before me decided they didn't want me in. I got blackballed. Wow. And so I was um, persona non grata. So I moved to mm. Pennsylvania. My dad had sold his business, gotten a job up north. Mom was planning on moving up north, but I went ahead so that I could find a, an escape. Very small branch of Penn State called the Barron College in Erie, Pennsylvania. Signed up, and in the spring of 1992, no, no, this would be the spring of 1993, excuse me, my very first professor was the first gay man I've ever met, or the first openly mm. gay man. And I was so fascinated by his confidence. I'm like, no, no, you're not supposed to admit this out loud. You guys are weird. You're like the weird people. But he was just confident and he completely lived who he was. His entire academic, um, you know, research was all around sexuality. I've never heard any of this. But what happened is I did an independent study with him and he's the first person who listened to me wow. and let me talk about everything that I was struggling with without trying to fix me. Hmm. And he was raised Catholic. So he had a lot of challenges with being rejected and he had a lot of challenges with the church and with faith. So we have that in common, but he also was, um, he was an English professor, and so he was deep into literary criticism, which was essentially one of the first places that critical theory took held in the academy. So the person who validated me the most mm. was the person I emulated the most. Mm. And I was so desperate for somebody to understand me and I tried, and I know this is common today, I couldn't find any Christian who had any idea that there was anything happening in the world outside of their world. Hmm. They weren't a part of, I mean, you know, my parents were married in the 60s. I mean, they missed the sexual revolution altogether. So, you know... <laughs> We were, our, we're Gen X, you know, I'm born in 73, so it gives a solid, you know, we just really are not brought up in all of that. We miss that. So our parents didn't go through all that, you know. So it was a really um, validating time for me because it was also intellectually just completely, uh, it was seducing, it was fascinating, it was interesting, it was an entirely different world where I could be accepted for whoever I wanted to be, not who everybody thought I should be. Hmm. Maybe walk through a little bit of some of those beliefs, because you describe yourself specifically as Marxian feminist. Yes. What do you mean by that in, in particular? Sure. So 
feminism, I think it's important just for a little bit of context that, you know, we kind of organize it into like these four waves. So when it first starts, it's just about making sure women have equality with men in sense of, you know, it's going to book account, bank accounts and property, et cetera. So that's the first wave. Well, the second wave was when we started to look at sexuality and equality of the sexes. And so we, you know, if we say men and women are different, that means that, well, they're valued differently and have different roles in society. And that's a problem. So we need to make sure that we eliminate difference in favor of sameness. So this is where I come in. So feminists, all of them want equality across political, economic um, spheres of life. But there's different kinds of feminists, and they differ on what's the source of the inequality. So a Marxist feminist says, hey, listen, women are not the same as men in terms of their access to political freedom, economic freedom. Uh, you, you know, they're viewed different, differently culturally. You know, their roles are different. So the source of that, though, for a Marxist feminism is comes out of Marxist theory, which says all the problems in the world are, cap you know, come from capitalism because it basically keeps the rich rich and the poor poor. So for a Marxist feminist, we say, OK, we're not equal. And the reason we're not equal is because capitalism is an economic system that reinforces it reinforces patriarchal systems such as the family, where you have a male authority figure and everybody serves him. He goes out, he makes all of the money, and then everybody works to support that. So what happens is women can never break out of their roles as wives and mom, moms to achieve economic independence. So it was like, wait a minute, I can't be a mom and be equal to men. So the only way I can really be equal to men is if I have children and farm them out to daycare or to somebody else so I can work and have economic independence and have economic equality. So what happens is that Marxian piece is brings in the really political piece of uh, of economics, but primarily with capitalism and how it is the the source of all evils, and it is what keeps women and the oppressed classes down. Okay, if that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's that's super helpful. So you have this professor who's just sounds like a thoughtful, caring individual, Very. who's meeting certain emotional needs that you have, giving you this worldview. Were there other professors that also play a role? Were there students that played a role? What are some of the other factors contributing to this radical worldview shift for you? An entire English department was at okay. my was at my fingertips. Mm. So it was very interesting because you had women who were the they were part of the Gloria Steinem, you know, generation. They were the ones who marched. They were the ones who um, started to they they were the generation of the feminists who brought women and gender studies into the universities. And so they were teaching women and gender studies. And this was also at a time where you started to have lots and lots of um, discussion over the Western canon. So which, you know, the dead white men that we read, you know, all of, all of the literature from then, but there's not enough women, there's not enough representation. So I'm taking classes on, you know, women writers, um, history is nothing but the story of dead white men. And interestingly, I'll never forget because I don't remember any of their names, but the head of the humanities department called me in once because there was a white male European history professor up for tenure. And she recruited a bunch of students to spy on him and basically give her enough information to get him. <laughs> and he lost his tenure. So I got caught up in that. Goodness. But I also, I was living in a house of one of the professors and we were all, I mean, <laughs> these were all English majors. And I mean, we were reading all the feminists, their poetry and their writing, the you know, some of the big names, Kate Millett, Andrea Dworkin, Anne Sexton, Adrian Rich. And the irony is all these people end up 
dying young or committing suicide. And we're talking about that was the cost they had to pay. You know, that was the price they paid. They martyred for the cost. So I am like in this 24 seven all the time. I'm being recruited to ruin other people's lives. And I was, but I mattered. I was a part of a team. I had community until I didn't. Mm. So let's get to that part until I didn't. But when you're being brought into this, this was fulfilling. This was meaningful. Like that season was positive for you as a whole. Very. Right? Yeah. Okay. Did you, are you having conversations with your parents about how you're shifting here or are they clueless to what's taken on, taking place in your life? I'm telling them, but they're clueless. So I'm from Orlando. So when I would go home, well, well, my, well, when I would go home before they ended up, um, I mean, there was some difference in moving, you know, north, south, so to speak. But I would go talk to one of my aunts, my dad's sister, and regale her with all of this for hours. I don't think she had a clue what I was saying. <laughs> I don't think she cared. But she just let me talk. I mean, I'm like telling her, this is hilarious. I mean, I'm a little girl from the south. And I'm literally telling her, did you know that all sex is rape? Did you know that? I mean, Andrea Dworkin, look at this. I had no idea. Of course, then I'd look at her. And if you looked at her, you'd be like, not exactly the icon of Western (laughs) beauty. And you're like, well, I don't know what's going on. So I just, I mean, I, years later, I was like, I'm so sorry. (laughs) I'm sorry. But she would listen. But I asked my mom even recently, and she said, Kelly, I have no clue what's going on. I didn't know what you were talking about. It was just, Mm. No idea. No clue. No idea. Okay. So was the first crack more emotional and experiential or was it intellectual? It's a good question. I think the intellectual started and then the emotional followed. Hmm. And I'll tell you why. A Marxist worldview is inconsistent and incoherent. You ultimately are Marxist in your theory about the role of women in society, but all these professors go home to the homes that they own, fee simple, and, you know, they're also being paid salaries in a free market economy. So it started to be like, does it really work in reality? The other piece that was happening is my parents raised me, you can grow up and be and do anything you want to be and do when you grow up. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, whatever. However, if you choose to have children, you must stay home and raise them. Mm. You cannot work and raise children, period, end of story. So I felt like I had a mixed message. And so I always knew that these women who had children and were having others take care of them, whether they were in state-funded daycare or private daycares, were bad moms. Mm. And so I just started to be very confused, but I, I really, you know, it's kind of like the Black Lives Matter and they, you know, they have a mansion for their headquarters and you're just like, something's not working here. You're talking about the need for socialism and the destruction of capitalism. And the only way women are going to be equal is to destroy capitalism, but you are living, breathing, and succeeding and thriving in a free market economy. So that was the first crack. The second crack that was emotional, one of, uh, one of the things that's an important part of the sexual revolution, you have to destroy the patriarchy that keeps women subjugated. And the nuclear family is the core institution that serves patriarchy in the West. Because that's how women learn to accept a father as an authority figure. So there's this passive acceptance of patriarchy from the time that you're very small. You also learn the role of a, a, a submissive wife or a wife who's nurturing, who's a mom, mm-hmm. takes care of the house, cooks the meals, da 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 da. I mean, we all grew up with that type of a family. You know, mom stayed home and, and dad worked. So there was this a figure that many have heard of named Herbert Marcuse, who comes along in the 1960s, write this, writes this book called Eros and Civilization. And what he says is we have to take the body 
the body itself, if we can turn the body into nothing but a source of pleasure, we can start to crack at the patriarchy because the girls who are going out and who are being promiscuous are violating their dad's commands. They're making themselves unfit for marriage, and so therefore they won't continue in that institution. So part of being a card-carrying feminist, especially a Marxian feminist, is extreme promiscuity. And that's a hugely important part, because that's you saying, hey, I'm just going to completely ignore everything you're saying i'm going to take control of my life and the way i control my life is through my body and it's a giant you know it's just a complete and total rebellion against you know husbands and fathers and that whole concept so but after a while there's this thing called reality that gets in the way <laughs> you hit the wall and you're like there's nobody left you know, you're graduating college, they're moving on, there's nobody there to, you're not a part of anything anymore. You're kind of just, in a word, I mean, it's like even the feminists start to be like, you're just a slut. You're just gross. I mean, they even start to turn on their own. We see that a lot in, in modern culture. And then you wake up one day and you're like, there is absolutely nothing fulfilling about this. It's not fixing anything. Mm. And I still need a paycheck. And it's a capitalist economy, and so I'm just, you feel let down because those who brought you along have no responsibility for the fallout. Hmm. When reality hits, you're now inconvenient. So they push you aside to get their next recruit. And the idea is that you're supposed to be ruined, but we know that there's nothing broken that God cannot repair. Hmm. My father-in-law had Herbert Marcuse as a professor at UCSD in the early 70s, interestingly enough, for Intro to oh. Philosophy. Yeah, we've had some oh, wow. interesting conversations about that. But wow. I want to get to when you started to investigate and consider Christianity. But do you think Marxian feminists and the others in your English department got certain things right? What can others, in particular Christians, learn from what they did, either emotionally or intellectually? Because clearly people follow it, so there must be something profoundly appealing about it, intellectually or emotionally. What things do you think they have their finger on? They listen to people where they're at. Okay. And they do not try to fix them overnight. Hmm. They are so committed to their own worldview that they are not threatened by somebody who comes in with a different worldview because it will deconstruct in time. And, and I think that's the big one. They know, they know what they believe and why they believe it very profoundly. And they know why they don't believe in organized religion and Christianity specifically. They actually know Christianity better than most Christians know Christianity. Mm. I was able to have more questions answered by them than I was by any Christian I ever knew my entire life. And that's still the case today until I'd say until about the last two years. Okay, there's a radical shift in the last two years, but that's a... That's a powerful answer that really is indicting on the church in terms of having answers and depth, why we believe what we believe. Mm -hmm. But I've often said, what if somebody was hurting in life for whatever reason and their first thought was, I need to find a Christian because a Christian would just hear me out and listen non-judgmentally. And that's right. not the first thought that comes to most people's minds. Yeah in part because we're not confident enough in terms of what we believe to not be threatened by people who see the world differently. So I'm so glad I asked you that. That was a great response. Talk about, did you just, so you're seeing the holes in this experientially, intellectually. Were you like, I'm going to check out New Age and Islam? Did you consider atheism? What, at what worldviews did you consider and how did Christianity fit into that? 
atheism. I had to suppress Christianity in order to absorb, which I didn't understand at the time was materialism. But in order for me to follow the Marxian feminist line, you know, the problem isn't sin, it's class struggle, right? It's oppression of, of you know, you have a, an oppressor class, an oppressed class. So oppression is the big problem. They just were completely incompatible. I never believed Jesus wasn't real. But in retrospect, I don't know that I understood enough about what it all meant to really own it and believe it. You know, I was saved at age five, so to speak, but I had no idea what it really meant to, to trust the Lord and anything or what it meant to have the indwelling spirit, so on. So what I did is I just suppressed it to say, well, if I believe in no God, then, as Margaret Sanger said, there are no masters, mm -hmm. there are no gods. So then there are no rules. And having grown up with nothing but rules, it wasn't about the freedom at Christ. It was basically in high school, don't drink. And if you have sex before you're married, I will kill you. It was sort of, those are the two messages that you get. And then you realize that, well, I don't have to tell mom. And so she's never going to know. And so she didn't kill me. But it doesn't tell you why. And I think that why really, really matters. So I didn't know the why of Christianity. So I just kind of set it aside, but there was a whole lot of information coming at me about why it was horrible mm -hmm. and why a girl like me who was precocious and had a lot of intellectual interests could never be fulfilled if she's serving in a patriarchal marriage. Wow. It was marriage and family or it was intellectual fulfillment. You couldn't have both. You know this, but what's so sad about that is since 1988 is the amount of Americans who think that married people are thriving and fulfilled has taken a nosedive. At the same time, the data has shown that it's actually married people who are happiest and thrive the most. So here's this group of people wanting to be happy, wanting to be fulfilled, but so entrenched in a worldview cannot see the data that the traditional family is not oppressive it's not controlling it actually sets people free because it's rooted in reality now what Bingo. what was it so you looked at atheism you i think maybe looked at new age a little bit what was it that made you say okay there's something to christianity were you going and visiting churches were you talking with scholars were you reading apologetics books like what was bringing you over or were you just reading the gospels what was bringing you back to christianity so to speak so i think there's a two-part answer to that the first part is one night while i was in college we were out partying and i was absolutely wasted and we were walking home and you know precocious as I am, we just start doing cartwheels in the middle of the street, you know, two in the morning on the way back to the professor's house where I was in the attic. I was the mad woman in the attic. And, you know, I was doing cartwheels on the way back and I broke my ankle. Mm. So all of a sudden that was a little bit of a wake up call and I just freaked out. So I'm like three blocks away from a church, which was uh, called the Family Worship Center. I don't even know if it is there anymore, but it was a black charismatic church. So the next couple of days, or you know, whatever the next Sunday was, I make my way down on my crutches because I was like, <laughs> you got to give. This is not okay. And I went and the, the sermon was on seven steps to demon possession. And I had decided I was at like number five. You know, I self-diagnosed. <laughs> and a week before that, a friend of mine from one of my classes um, who was 40 died of congestive heart failure mm. as a complication from HIV AIDS. And none of us knew she was sick. But I went to her funeral. And I, I mean, it was basically the eulogy was Narcotics Anonymous. And I had this vision. And I don't know that it was real or if it was in my head. 
but it was like I could see her in hell. I just saw her in torment. And then like a week later, I break my ankle and then I'm in church. And I'm like, okay. So now I'm like, I have to forget everything that I've learned in school. I kid you not, Sean, I drop out of college. I see a guy across the, the aisles who's very handsome. And I'm like, the cure to my ills is to get married and start my own family. So eight months later, I marry him, complete disaster. Mm. Five months later, I'm in a police escort out of there. I drive from Erie to Orlando with my little car and what fit in it. More my fault than his. But then I realized that that wasn't the answer. So obviously, Christianity isn't the fit. And there were a lot of things that led to that decision and, you know, not to belabor that point. But then I got a job working for a retired law professor in Washington, D.C. in the beginning of, uh, you know, the end of Christianity began again. Because, you know, there's no room for Christianity in the law. There's no room for Christianity in modern society, so on and so forth. So it would be another... Um, it would probably be another 10 to 12 years before I even began to think about Christianity again. And it was when my dad um, got sick and passed away in 2006. And mm -hmm. I was with him when he took his last breath. He had Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. He was very young. He was only 68. And I, it's like I could see his, his, it was like his soul separated from his body. Like the life left him. Yeah, it was nothing but a body. And that began the process back. So that was about 2006. And it was like, okay, but I was terrified to open the Bible and read it, refused mm. to read the Bible. So it was just this very weird fear that I would be ostracized if I admitted I was a Christian. I had no idea what Christianity really was. I just knew that it was the faith of my parents. But I also knew that it would mean if I followed its rules, I wouldn't be having any fun at all. And you wouldn't mm. want to have that. Okay, so you got this fear of being ostracized. You're triggered by seeing this happen with your father, understandably so. It's the faith of your parents, and yet you opened the Bible and you started studying it. So what what happened? What Take us on the next steps. So um, I met my husband on Match.com. <laughs> I'd been in a rela I'd been in a relationship with a with an agnostic, um, you know, for about three or four years while I was in law school, and I knew when my dad passed away, so he goes like twelve days without food or water. My then boyfriend, I'm in law school, and um, I'm going to law school at night. I'm working during the day, so this is like a big deal. Like you know, I'm out like three weeks of my life. And my boyfriend didn't come to Orlando, I was living in D.C. at the time, to be with me during the 12 days. He comes after for the funeral. And I thought, well, I don't need you now. I needed you the 12 days before my dad died. And then I realized in that moment, he does not believe that my dad is in the same place where I believe. And so I knew that we were going to hit a wall. I continued to date him for another year because when I was in grief, counsel grief counseling, I got the best advice I've probably ever gotten as a practical matter. And she said, listen, just forget about him. Don't worry about marrying him. Just, you know, your friends, you have the same friend group. Just, you know, enjoy the relationship. And then one day you'll wake up and, you know, decide that you don't want to be married to an atheistic alcoholic and then you'll be done. So, you know, a year later that happened and I was like, I, I need to get over him. So I went on match.com and two days later I met who's now my husband of 16 years. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a quote, quiet Christian raised Lutheran and meeting him was the slow journey back to faith being safe again for me. Mm -hmm. But it, it was very slow and it was, and it was very methodical, and it was very Lutheran, certainly not charismatic, and, and you know, certainly not um, anything that I was used to as a kid. Mm. 
So it's kind of a long, okay. slow journey. That, so that makes sense. Now, one of the other pieces of your story you've shared and you hinted at earlier is going back and meeting your birth mom and yeah. how that affected you. So unpack that for us. Sure. So when I turned 21, so this would have been 1994 for some context, my mother told me that she had tried to find me when I was 15. She mm. says, it's, it's your information. You're old enough to handle it now. Your dad and I blocked it because you weren't ready for that. So she gave me that information. Well, the precocious person I am, um, I contacted the adoption agency. It was a closed adoption in Florida, which they all were at that time. I contacted the adoption agency, and it turned out that, Sean, she had kept her information up to date with the agency all the years. So if I ever wanted to make contact, huh. it would be easy to do so. Amazing. And more than that, she had always sent in to the agency. Um, she was a singer, songwriter, kind of amateur. I did not get that from her. But um, she would write all these poems and sort of set to music. But she sent all of these to the agency. So if I ever contacted them and wanted to know, I would have them. So I get call. I get this package of love letters from her to me, my whole life in the mail. And I'm reading them and I'm in, I mean, remember, I'm a hurting puppy from being younger, that I'm also knee deep in my feminism, you know, um, haircut and all. And it's like this, she, the way she wrote, I, it was like she understood who I was. Like, you know, my, our minds work the same way. Within three weeks, I'm on the phone with her. Hmm. But you have to understand, she was 13 when she got pregnant with me. She was raped twice, hmm. once at knife point um, by a black man. She and her girlfriend were hitchhiking. And then the next month, um, it was she was the object of a game of truth or dare. And her brother dared my biological father, who I don't know exists because he doesn't know I exist because he was 19, to have sex with his sister. And she didn't have a choice. So there was a second rape. And she never disclosed who the father was because he'd be arrested. So she had no idea if I was going to be black or white or who my father was. But she's 13. She turns 14. Her mother says, you're starting to get sick. Takes her to the doctor. The family doctor measures her belly. Mind you, this is the middle of 1973. Roe is January 22nd, 1973. So we're just months after Roe. And he says she's due October 22nd. One month too far in gestation to have an abortion under Florida law under Roe. Sean, I came November 22nd, one month later on Thanksgiving oh. day. She thought she was carrying a half black child from the rape. Turns out that I am, I was conceived when she was a pawn in her brother's game. And I came out Lily white. So that's how she knew who the father was. But had the doctor not gotten the due date wrong, I would not have been born. Holy cow. So it took wow. two months for me to be adopted. I still don't know the whole story, hmm. but uh, because she never disclosed the paternity of the father. But I met her like within a month of this. And she's only 35 and I'm 21. I thought this was going to be the panacea. I would finally understand who I was. But the reality was not an overshow. She was very, she, she had later, she'd become a Christian. She got married. She had two other children. But, you know, I thought, I mean, it was so raw for her. I just wasn't prepared for the experience. Gotcha. She had had so many problems. You know, she was a cutter. You know, she'd been through a lot of, um, you know, she was manic depressive, bipolar one. Her brother was schizophrenic. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm like legit crazy. But it was so shocking to what I grew up with as, you know, sort of a, you know, middle class Christian kid. 
And so I just could not reconcile. You know, if you're people who listen to country music, it's like the Reba McIntyre song. You know, I might have been born plain white trash, but fancy was my name. I literally was born plain white trash. And I was like, it was just so much for me to process and understand. And it was too much for me. Hmm. It was very heavy. And um, yet I understood who I was and why I was the way I was. And that created a whole nother level of complexity for me sure about identity and who we are okay so another piece of your story related to the topic of abortion is the overturning of roe versus wade which is very recent i know Mm -hmm. we're skipping over a lot in your story but take us to that and how Mm -hmm. it affected you so this is january i mean this is june excuse me of 2022 coming on the heels of COVID. And I was starting to kind of go back into the, you know, equity of women, you know, having had a long legal career. And I was extremely active on LinkedIn and wrote every day. And then all of a sudden, you know, you start to hear, I mean, all this stuff about women and maternity leave. And it was like, it just was very weird about, you know, women are, you know, they are not paid for their labor at home and therefore they're suppressed. You know, you, I start to hear all this sort of Marxian feminism coming back into my head. Roe is overturned. And for the next few months, the absolute shock of what women were posting about how important their abortions were for their own success, they would not have had the careers they had had they not had abortion. It was shameless, Mm -hmm. but it was vile, but it was different than it used to be. And all of a sudden I'm reading these that, you know, women who were raped, women who, you know, anything from incest, which is it's rape or something very weird with consenting adults, but that they should never be forced birthers you can't force a woman to carry a child from a rape and i'm like okay we're hitting close to home and then how it's better to kill a child and to terminate pregnancy than to put them in the foster care system or a life where they would be in poverty and as it just started to grow and i'm watching and i'm going you're basically telling me my life doesn't matter and in that process, I found a couple of people who were, is actually a friend of mine. He's a federal prosecutor and um, he's become a friend of mine, but he started to be very, very firm on pro-life conversations. And so I sort of messaged him and I was like, thank you for having courage to say this in this sort of sea of crazy. And it was through that process of talking through my feelings about it that I realized that this was a bigger deal. This was a religious level commitment. This was bigger. And a lot had happened in my life during COVID. There'd been a lot of breaking professionally, personally. And in this moment, I realized, and I read Vadi Bakum's fault line, and I was like, I have to pick a side. I can't do this middle anymore. These people are telling me my life doesn't matter and I'm going to show them how much it does matter and how much they wish I never was born like it was sort of this visceral feeling like you did not just go there you are selfish you are disgusting and I also know that deep inside you are miserable because you are trying to live for everybody else's approval and you are living contrary to reality Hmm. it's just not real But at the same time, Sean, I become pretty selfish as a wife. I mean, I just looked and I was like, I care far more about myself in 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 very subtle ways. Like, I just took my marriage for granted. It wasn't a big deal. Um, You know, I did my thing. He was very supportive. He's a history professor. He's a brilliant man. Like, you know, we're just like, everything's fine. But this deep-seated feeling, knowing 
that I had to pick, I, I couldn't choose. I had to pick a side, and that was the beginning. So what I did is I took all my books from college. I don't throw anything out. So I took all these books that I read, all the feminists, all the pro-abortion stuff, all of why we need abortion. And I started to read and I started to read and read. And then the other thing I did is I listened to the oral argument of every single time abortion has been to the Supreme Court, which is now approximately 25 times across since 1973 and I listened to the it's usually Planned Parenthood the lawyers representing the pro-abortion side argue for why we need abortion and it dawned on me they don't care about women there is no such thing as choice the only thing is make sure she has abortion she can never choose to not have one because what would that do that would go back to reinforce the reality of the nuclear family and the importance of motherhood. They cannot afford to give an inch and to listen to these women argue for why a child should not have parental consent to have an abortion because it would deny her access. It was so vile. And so then becomes the, you know, the philosophy, the apologetics. And the next thing you know, I'm like, I have to go to seminary. <laughs> you know, it just became, but that's what it was. And it was through that process. I've been so broken over the years. And, and I'll leave it, you know, and I'll cap it with this. My mom and I had a really hard relationship. It was really tough because I was a tough kid. What she saw was good for me. What I thought was good for me were very different. We struggled a lot. And in the summer of 2023, my mom was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer and given six to nine months. And in that moment, everything shifted for me. And I said, nothing matters that has happened before. I have a short amount of time to enjoy my mother. And we began to, she's now a very mature Christian. We've long put everything to bed. And I said to her, I, I said, you know, Lord, just help me heal this, figure out a way. And since that time, she has been helping me grow in the Lord. And she said to me, I now know why. Two things. I know why you were placed with your dad and me. So that I could go before you and learn. This is about the things of the Lord. And then I could teach you. And I know why he allowed your whole life and everything you've been through to happen for this moment so he could use you because he uses the broken so that you could share with others. And so my mom is, is still with us, but she's she's nearing the end. But it's like it just has come full circle. And I am so, so passionate about helping people understand there's no shame and recognizing reality and living your life in accordance with it. And Christianity is real. It is the story of reality. And it's the only way to live a peaceful life. So that's sort of the big, that's a lot in a nutshell. So I've got a ton of questions for you. You've only got a couple minutes. But have you gone back to some of the professors, if they're still there, who are so open and accept people where they're at and had this conversation? Or have they moved on and that just hasn't happened yet? I stayed in touch with Dr. Champagne from um, from um, Penn State Erie, and he's still there. Um, we have not, he knows I'm conservative. We've not confronted it directly, but we have stayed in touch, and I've always appreciated him for who he has been in my life and for listening mm. to me. Um, I haven't been in touch with the others, just I didn't have that, that sure. level of relationship, and they certainly, most of them have moved on. Um, but one day I, I intend to have a, a follow up with him, but I, he taught me that gay people are not crazy. They're not weird. Uh, they are image bearers just like everybody else is. And so, Amen. um, he's been enormously influential because, um, I respect that he has pursued his passion and his worldview more consistently and more vigorously 
than most Christians um, that I know, generally speaking. Um, but we can agree to disagree, but I am, God has used him mightily in my life. And um, we never, we never discard people who've been important in our lives. Amen. Well said. So last question, you describe Christianity as reality. And this obviously is a huge question, but why do you think Christianity is true? Why are you a Christian? I am a Christian because, uh, well, let me step back. Once I understood that Christianity does not begin at the cross, it begins at Genesis 1. I understood that Christianity is the story of how the world began, how humans came into the world, and also how the world will end. And once I understood that everything that has happened historically and everything that will happen in the future, how God's programs are laid out, how he has dealt with mankind over time, and how, um, and, and how I, I should say, he has explained it to us and given us a written word that he has promised to protect, that is true, that we can prove is true, and he has given it to us through specific, he has given us specific revelation, and he has also given us a general revelation that once I started to look at every other worldview, they have to borrow from the Christian worldview in order to get to human dignity, to human value, and that nothing else was consistent. So as I started to build from the beginning, if we're just advanced animals, then the world makes sense because everybody's acting like an animal. But if we're something special and different, how, how was it that I didn't wind up in an abortionist's office? Something, something bigger was there. Hmm. But it was the consistency. You can't get to human rights. You can't get to human value. You can't get to dignity. And looking on the abortion side of it, when I was looking at the law, you also can't get to justice or fairness on this side of heaven without Christ. Kelly, great answer. This has been one of the most interesting and enjoyable in the best sense of the term interviews I've done in a while. Thanks for your vulnerability, for your honesty to come on, and just may God bless these moments with your mom that they're just meaningful and rich mm -hmm. and your studies through this time. I think God's got his hand on your life, and I look forward to so much more yet to come. So really, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me, Sean. It's, it's a real blessing. I appreciate it. Those of you watching, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got a lot of other fascinating stories and interviews and content coming up. And uh, we would love to have you join us at Biola University. I teach in the apologetics program there, and we have the top-rated apologetics program. And uh, think about information is below. Think about joining us. And uh, we will see you soon on the next uh, episode that airs. Kelly, this has been great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sean.